so I'm Amit Agarwal, a product manager at Google. I work with the platforms team there, the team that is in charge for the infrastructure on which Google services uh, run and operate. In the last uh, 25 minutes or so, Rakesh covered the use of SDN within large-scale data centers. In the next 25 minutes or so, I'll be covering the use of SDN in the van and also covering the use of SDN between large-scale data centers. So firstly, before we begin, I'd like to say that no data center is an island. I mean, data centers don't exist by themselves. They're very much interconnected to devices, maybe to other users, to other services, and they're very much living. And lastly, they're also connected to other data centers. So with that in mind, here's the agenda I have for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, we'll be covering trends, some of the trends that are shaping uh, WAN usage, and also cover some of the need for a large-scale global data centers. Then we'll be covering some of the user requirements. What do users want in terms of services? And lastly, what I want to do is to tie the trends and user requirements together and see how STN can help and, out and outline some of the benefits that STN can provide. So today we have a lot more internet users. So I'm just taking a look at the World Bank data, and it seems from uh, in the year 2000, we had 400 million internet users. And in 2010, we had 2 billion internet users. So we've gone from around 7% of the world's population having access to internet to around 30% of the world's population having access to internet in 10 years. Very, very impressive growth indeed, if you consider any kind of uh, compounded growth. But that's not all. I think today we are a lot more global also. We just don't have a lot more users, but we are a lot more global. So here in this chart, what I show you is for each country, the number of internet users, and I also show you the number of internet users as a percentage of the population of that country. So on the x-axis, we, we have the internet users as a percentage of the population, and on the y-axis shows you the number of internet users. The size of the bubble here represents the number of internet users. So in 2000, we don't see anything fancy here. Most of the countries have insignificant internet usage. A few countries do pop up, most of these are the develop, developed markets, most notably uh, United States, and that sits around 50% of the United States population. Fast forward 10 years, this is 2010. The picture looks very, very different. So if, if you look on the bottom right-hand corner, you pretty much see all the developed markets have an internet penetration of 80 plus percent or so. Right? It covers United States, Japan, Canada, so on and so forth. What, what is surprising are the bubbles on the left-hand side and the bubble on the top. The bubble on the top is China. It stands at 450 million plus users or so, and that's, that's less than 40, 45% of China's population. If you consider another bubble at the right, India, that's around 95 million users or so, and that's less than 10% of the internet population, 10% of the population of India. So this is something that you need to keep in mind when you're considering what you should be doing. You've got to plan for the current users, or you've got to provision for the current users, but you've got to plan for, for the next generation of users, where they are going to come from. Unfortunately, many of these will not be coming from the developed markets. The next thing I want to talk about is how are these users accessing the internet? So today, we see a lot of usage from, uh, from endpoints that are mobile phones and, and smart devices, whether it be smartphones or tablets for that matter. These have become very powerful over the last, last few years, and many, many of them today pack in enough power equivalent to desktops just a few years ago. And they also come with very good features, for example, 3, 3G, 4G networking, the ability to take and capture high-definition videos, a playback high-definition high videos, high-resolution cameras, NFC chips, and so on. So besides just covering the, the raw horsepower and the features that come packed in these devices, what's remarkable about these devices is that they're ubiquitous and disposable. I don't carry my TV with me. I don't carry my camera with me. I don't carry my laptop with me. But I carry my cell phone every single place, 24 by 7, right? That's what makes it very, very ubiquitous. And this has huge, huge impact in terms of what we provision, not just networks, but services, availability, all of that. Secondly, today, many of these devices are becoming disposable. And what do I mean by disposable? 
it takes me less and less time to, get, to lose my device and get, uh, jump, get uh, jump started with the new device. For example, I could lose my device right now and be back up and running in less than half an hour, maybe 25 minutes. Everything is backed up and synced up in the cloud, which makes these devices very, very disposable. In the future, we could have these phones serving multiple functions. They could be a wallet, they could be a passport, they could also be a house and, a house and car keys. So if these devices take that kind of function, you need to really think about what kind of security, what kind of availability, reliability, and 24 by 7 access do you want to provide? So I had this interesting quote from the Indian census just to highlight how these devices are growing and how they are spreading. So this is from the Indian census for 2011. There are far more mobile phones than toilets in India. Next thing I'd like to talk about is apps and services. Uh, this slide, by the way, is no way representative of the list. There are a few hundreds of thousands of apps and services available today on your smartphones and your mobile devices. But what this does, but what this gives you some idea is the breadth of apps and services that exist today. They range from a very broad spectrum, whether it be gaming, entertainment, productivity apps, imaging, translation, and the list goes on and on. And it's surprising we've just got started on this. It's just been a handful of years, and we are seeing such a growth in number of apps and services. The amount of resources these apps and services require are very diverse. Whether if, we, if I just pick up networking needs, whether it be latency requirements or bandwidth requirements, they are very, very different. So whatever we plan and provision in terms of network needs to support a very diverse set of applications and services. And especially, many of these apps and services have network effects. Right? If you pick up social networking, if you pick up video conferencing for the matter, the growth is, is not really linear as the number of users grow. So basically, if I, if I take a look at these three things, so we have basically more and more users, smarter and more powerful endpoints, and a rich app and uh, service ecosystem, you put them all together, and what you really get is a virtuous circle. Right? So we really have this humongous growth in data coming from all of these cycles here. So just for an example, today, around more than 850,000 Android devices are activated on a daily basis. Every single second, 60 minutes of video is uploaded on YouTube. Right? Th think, about, think about this. I mean, by the time I've done watching an episode of Grey's Anatomy or Fringe, there is enough content uploaded on YouTube that can keep me busy for 10 hours a day for an entire year. I mean, this is fantastic growth from all respects, right? So in terms of the infrastructure, whether it be compute, storage, or network, what we need is, is going to be fantastically coming in the coming years. So we talked about some of the trends. I would like to briefly go over some of the user requirements here to see, as a user, what do I expect? Right? I don't understand BGP. I don't understand ISIS. I basically have an app and service. I don't understand network fabrics. What, do I, what am I looking for, and how do these requirements translate into some of the network fabrics or the network solutions we are thinking about, right? So first is fast and interactive. Users don't often state this requirement, but we all know here what happens if an application or service is not fast and responsive. The user engagement is very, very low, and the user experience is very sad. So what, what can we do about making apps fast and interactive? And by the way, I, I don't say this just based on anecdotal evidence. At Google, we have done experimental studies that highlight this. So for example, one study that we did was we artificially introduced delay in Google search results. So what we found was that with a 400 millisecond delay in serving Google search results, we saw a 0.6% decrease in the number of queries a user does. When we decreased that latency from 400 millisecond to 200 millisecond, we saw the number of uh, the decrease in number of queries go from minus 0.6 percent or 0.6 percent to 0.3 percent. So basically, there is a measurable impact because of this. It is not just user experience and feedback. So what do we do to make uh, application and services fast? There are lots of things that we can do, right? So and, and you need to you need to understand here that speed of light is not really a friend here. If you are serving a user in, say, Southeast Asia from a data center in the United States, 
it's going to take you 60 to 100 milliseconds regardless, no matter how fast light travels. That, that's pretty much re reaching the limits of the speed of light. So if you want to make apps and services faster, you ought to look at options of moving data closer to the users, maybe faster connections, maybe have more of the connections, maybe have better traffic management. All of these things that make the, the apps and services more fast and more interactive. Next, let's look at what are users willing to pay for many of these apps and services. And how many of you guys pay for Google Web Search or Google Maps or for browsing and viewing uh, most of the videos on YouTube? Well, what if some, suddenly I said you've got to pay something? Right? So pretty much, I mean, users have gotten to a model where they expect most of the apps and services to be free or low price. Right? And business models have evolved around that. I mean, today we look at monetizing services based on, say, ads or offering different versions of a product. It could be a base offering which is free, a premium offering which, uh, which is charged. Right? So lots of different models have been exposed. The interesting thing here is if you have a large and growing application or service and you have monetized it, you still want to make sure that the infrastructure underlying is very, very efficient and utilized effectively. Right? Because it, it really is going to impact the, the growth that the, that the service can sustain. How do you go about utilizing and making your infrastructure more effectively? Right? If you are a network intensive service or a network heavy service, you got to make sure the networking resources are used effectively. Right? Say so for example, and we all know that CPU costs and storage costs have come down. Right? But the network costs haven't come down at the same pace as CPU and storage costs. Similarly, I mean, what you would pay for a 10 gig pipe between uh, two regions in the United States is very, very different from what you would pay for a 10 gig pipe, say in Europe or Asia or Asia Pacific. But we all talked about how the next wave of users are going to come from these emerging markets. How do you make sure the pipes are similar, are cheaper or, or, or comparable so that you can sustain that growth? It may not happen very fast, but you've got to build systems around that that effectively use whatever you have, it, whether it be the WAN bandwidth, whether you have traffic engineering in place, but you've got to use whatever you have very efficiently to make sure that you utilize your infra infrastructure well. So basically, the bottom line here is if you have a large growing service, you've got to make sure that you lower the cost of running the service. Next, we move on to availability. I mean, it's funny because most of our, um, the, many of the companies sold on the promise that you can access your service anytime, anywhere, and now you have to go and make sure that promise holds true, right? And this is true because of a variety of different reasons. I mean, today the cloud does run mission critical applications where you want to make sure that you have this kind of availability. Secondly, for the, maybe for the first time, we actually, the users actually have devices using which they can access services 24 by 7 mobile phones and smartphones. Earlier, it was not very the case. You had limited number of computing hours, and you could only access services in a given period of time. Lastly, I think with the global user base, what's really happening, global user base and, uh, and mobility, what's really happening is the notion of uh, having a downtime at 2 a.m. on Saturday is, fast, is, is, go, is, is fading pretty fast, right? Because you really can't, can't do that anymore. You don't really know when a user would want to access a service, and you have a 24-hour spectrum where users are accessing your service. Right? So basically, if you're thinking about services, you got to make sure that you have high availability built into your service. And this is not something which can be built into one layer of the stack. It has to build into, be built into all the layers of the stack to make sure. And networking is one of those layers where you have to make sure that high availability is there. So basically, we talked about some of the trends that are shaping van usage. We talked about some of the user requirements in terms of what users want from the apps and services. Now I'd like to see how we can fit these together and see how, how and if SGN can, can help us here and see if it provides any benefits. So I know you guys have gone through what SGN is throughout the course of the day and even before coming here. I'd, I'd just like to reiterate a little bit here and stress a few points here. So basically, what exactly is STN? STN pretty much is taking the control plane out from the data plane. So basically, what we had earlier was a box. Where everything was bundled in this box, whether it be control plane, management software, and of course, the, the data plane or the forwarding plane. 
What STN exactly is doing is taking that box and splitting it up into three parts, if you, if you, if you will. First, the data forwarding, data forwarding plane, which basically is in charge of forwarding the raw bits. The bits come in, you do some lookup, and you send the bits out. The control plane or the manage, and the man management plane, which is in charge of doing all the control decisions. And the, and the open flow or the protocol layer, which is basically making sure that the data for, or forwarding plane and the control plane are able to talk to each other. So what's unique here is by in this particular model, we are able to tap into all the work that has gone in networking the last few decades. That's a data, data forwarding plane. And we are able to tap into all the work that has gone into large scale distributed systems in the control plane. For example, today we don't think about how many users we are serving. I mean, Gmail has 350 million users or so. We serve them pretty well. The data is all synced up. It all, looks, it all works well. Right? So, what, so basically, we can leverage those kind of stuff right, from GFS, Bigtable, all those technologies in making a very robust, scalable, and distributed control plane. So basically, these two worlds coming together, which make SGN very, very powerful. I'd like to go over each of these components one by one and showcase how these help in, in building better, more glo global services. So firstly, we are looking at the data plane. I tend to think of this as the network devices. So the network devices can be made a lot more simpler and more scalable by getting the control plane out of the boxes. For example, let's look at MPLS. In concept, it was supposed to be very, very scalable, very simple. You had a fixed size label. You, you look up a fixed size label and decide where the packet goes in. And you can support multiple labels. You can, it's very, very fast to look up. But what really happens in practice? I mean, if you have a, a, a network with, say, 100,000 LSPs, the operator is literally sitting on the ed edge of the chair, making sure that some network event doesn't happen and cause a route churn and bring down my network. Or if they want to add a new LSP, they are pretty much trying it out for days or months to make sure the network doesn't go down. That, was, that wasn't really the promise of MPLS. So by removing the, the complexity, the control plane out of the boxes, the boxes can be really simple now. They can do best what they're designed to do best. Get in a packet, do some lookups, and forward the packet at line rate. Secondly, by moving the, the control plane out of the boxes, it's very easier for deployment and upgrades. And how often do you guys know when your Gmail was updated? Perhaps none. Right? And that's the model we should be going here, where it should be very easy to go and up upgrade these boxes. We talked about mobile phones being disposable. We should have something very similar here, where I could just go plug in a device, and it just works. Or if a line card fails, I remove the line card, plug in a new line card, it just works. So that's the model which I think STN can provide by removing all the complexity there and providing a transparent protocol. So what does all of this result in terms of, what, 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 as a service provider, what do I get, right? So firstly, I think it should result in lower CapEx, lower OpEx. And, and just for net, uh, networking companies out here, this does not necessarily mean that my networking budget has gone down. What this means is basically I might be paying lower per bit of forwarding. But as we saw with the, with the trend and the growth and everyth everything that we just saw, the usage of more and more networking is going to happen. The richer the services provide, the, the more the network is going to be used. Secondly, it should also result in higher availability because we may reduce the downtime during deployment, during upgrades, and during configuration changes. The next point I want to talk about is uh, the informa information exchange protocol, the protocol that binds the control plane with the data plane, uh, which, which is OpenFlow here. So basically, the whole promise of OpenFlow is, is to provide interoperability. So I can have networking devices from multiple different vendors. I can have my management or control plane from multiple different vendors. I can mix and match. I don't have to worry with it. I have a uniform interface for accessing all the networking devices. So basically, this opens up a, the possibility of choosing gear from multiple vendors. And this decoupling of network device uh, from management uh, and control software is just good from a pro programmatic way also. You're basically providing layers in the stack, which makes it very easy to, to program things and provide services. Lastly, I want to talk about the, the management of control software. This is the area I'm really passionate about, and I think uh, is, is the heart and core of SDN. So pretty much what you have done is you have taken all the 
control and management software that was there in these boxes, and now it can run in external controllers. So basically, it's, it's kind of a, it's in a form and fashion of a network operating system, which is bas basically managing all these network devices. There is no, uh, no limitation on how and where I run this network operating system. I could run it on five commodity servers. I could run it on 50 commodity servers. I am not limited to what I do on these, uh, do in this operating system layer. I could scale it as much as I want. I can add as much horsepower as I want. And I can do whatever fine grain calculations I want. The benefit of this approach is with this, with this um, centralized view of th viewing things, I see the network as one big fabric. I don't see it as 15 boxes or 20 boxes or 15 different boxes. I see it as one big fabric. So imagine if you were to do traffic engineering today the way you do it today, you don't have the global view. Right? With this, you have the global view. You can basically say, my link from US to Asia Pacific is more expensive. My links from, say, between these regions and US is cheaper. And I want to optimize it such that my traffic is going in a certain form and fashion. Earlier, you'd be limited to the regional knowledge. And you'd be limited to all the horsepower that was there in, in the networking boxes, which isn't all that much. Now you can basically do global optimization of your fabric and decide how and where you want to place uh, different services, how and where should traffic be flowing, and, and do things like deadline scheduling, and so on and so forth. Lastly, it also provides a way for application-driven application application -driven networking. And what I mean by this is today, applications are agnostic about the network. They treat the network as a black box. But ideally, I mean, if you have really large global services, you don't want to provide that abstraction. You want to make sure that the applications tell you beforehand, hey, I want 500 gigabits of, of traffic between so and so time. Can you provision it for me, or can you give it to me? Unless you do that, it's very difficult to meet large-scale global needs, especially when you're moving large amounts of data in the WAN, where bandwidth is still very limited. So I think with, with, the, with, the, with the global picture, you should have higher utilization. And this is very important in the WAN, because not just because the links are very expensive, but also because the bandwidth is fairly scarce here. Also, I think uh, what this opens up to is uh, a whole bunch of network services. So we have seen a flood of applications on mobile devices and smartphones. I, I don't see why we would not see something very similar um, using SDN why we not have vendors building up multiple innovative services, whether it be traffic engineering, load balancing, security for, for uh, endpoints, and so on and so forth. So basically, now you can really relinquish a lot of the network control to the applications, and the network OS and SDN will take care of that. So in summary, I, I think you, SDN has huge potential. So I think as our networks become more global, more larger, there is a need for better, better network management. SCN definitely provides that capability and ability. Secondly, uh, in terms of utilization and availability, SCN has really huge potential here because we, we can control the resources when we want to. We can tie the applications very, very closely to the network so that the, the, uh, the network knows beforehand what is wanted and when. So say, for example, if I need to send 100 terabytes of data between data center A and B, and if I know that's not very important, I don't need to do it right now. I could schedule it for some off time hours, maybe in the evening, maybe at 3 AM in the night, when the network is relatively free. So those kind of things are very, very possible now. And lastly, I talked about this, but uh, the, the innovation that can, be, that can be unleashed here by SDN in terms of various network apps and services, we may not have the 100,000 apps and services that are there in mobile phones, but I'm sure we'll be having a lot more than what we have today, because I think a lot of different people can participate in this ecosystem now. It doesn't necessarily have to be networking companies and networking vendors. So that's pretty much all I had. I hope you enjoy the ride. And we'll have Rakesh come up, and we are up for questions.